Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we would love to hear from you. Just send us an email, jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Well, it's the third Sunday in Advent. It is indeed. I hope you all had your baby Jesus is blessed over the weekend. Feast of uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. A feast. We've got a lot right. going on, it's right? Happening. So we're lighting candles and we're saying our prayers, adoring the Lord, uh, getting ready for his coming. So beautiful. Right. Well, today we have two very familiar faces to you all. Father John Tregilio and Father Ken Brigenti, who are co-hosts of the Web of Faith 2.0. Zero or 2.0, however you're saying that number. But they are the co-hosts of that great show. And they're going to be with us today. And you're going to have a conversation with them. And they're going to tell you things that maybe you didn't know about these two wonderful holy men of and God. And you can call in. We want you to call in, ask them some questions about the faith or about themselves. They're really here live today. Well, we had a great weekend. Powerful weekend. We um, did a couple of, there were a couple of things going on. The one thing I'll talk about was um, we had uh, a birthday party for Jesus at our local parish here, Our Lady of Sorrow, yeah. where some of our grandchildren were in that show and the, they did the manger and they reenacted the whole beautiful scene. But then the parish does a great blessing yeah. for our center. And the children bring gifts for the center, great. our needs, yeah. diapers, wipes, baby clothes, all those beautiful things. And it's a yeah. great, great blessing. And the Knights of Columbus also issue us a lovely check yeah. supporting our pregnancy medical center. I think we have a couple of pictures that are up. Um, the Knights of Columbus do the Keep Christ in Christmas. So at this time, celebrating the nativity of our Lord, um, all the children in the school mm -hmm. and uh, regular children, rank and file that may not be in the school, did all sorts of paintings and they put on it, Keep Christ in Christmas. Mm -hmm. And uh, just beautifully done. And, you know, I was just thinking, what a great catechesis for the children in the parish that they're going to have this nativity that they're setting up. Somebody does the reading of uh, the birth of our Lord. And then you got them all making these paintings, Keep Christ in Christmas. And then the focus is the Pregnancy Medical Center. Mm -hmm. And they're giving you know, to, to children today for the birth of children and the care for children. Um, and how this gets in mm -hmm. the next generation to come, that we are a sanctity of life people. And that the pinnacle for us in a lot of ways is for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is giving. That the world rejoices, the angels rejoice over the conception and birth of Jesus Christ. And even to this day, every time a child is conceived and a child is born, we rejoice. This is our heritage. This is our future. And then we had Sienna, one of our granddaughters, yes. who made her first reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And she was nervous and she was scared about it. Yeah. And um, so her mother took her, a faithful mother, raising her in the church. And so beautiful. And Sienna, she said after she made her confession. Right. She couldn't stop smiling. And we got two pictures there. One's a before and an after picture. And she was... So the first she, is she's a little bit, you know, and then after it, she's just beaming. Beaming. Yeah. And then she felt so clean and she was so precious and we were texting back and forth yeah. and keeping updated on her Saturday how it was going. Yeah. And then we got word she was dancing freely in Walmart just in celebration of the beauty of the act of confession on this We've precious We've been sharing child. for the season of Advent about preparation, about the coming of the Lord and how John the Baptist said, you know, prepare, repent, believe, bring the high places down, the low places up and so on. And Our Lady with the Immaculate Conception that the Lord prepared a place within her womb mm. for our Lord and Savior. And that one of the best things to do to prepare is to make a confession. If you haven't done so, Go to confession. It might be a month, two months, five, 10, 15, 20, 40 years, because you could be like Sienna. You won't stop smiling. You might be walking in a store and start dancing. Isn't it a great faith to hear your sins are forgiven? I absolve you of your sins. So if you are burdened, come back. Come back to the church. Go to confession. 
and be made whole. Well, and then we went to confession ourselves on the Feast of Immaculate mm -hmm. Conception, and we had our Advent confession, which was beautiful mm -hmm. and yeah. wonderful at the Blessed Sacrament. And then on Thursday night, I went to Demopolis, Alabama, which is <laughs> southwest of Birmingham, yeah. and I spoke at a Baptist women's... 100 uh, Baptist women. Uh, yeah, 100 Baptist women, and it was their Christmas celebration. And my talk was on the silhouettes of grace and encountering grace in our lives and how we do that and what, what it's supposed to look like and, and call them all and myself to a deeper conversion that mm. this would be the yeah. best Christmas ever. And, and we want to participate in that with God's riches at Christ's expense. Mm. That's the acronym for grace. And so there's ways where we encounter grace in our relationships and our love for the Lord and yeah. in ways that we live out our daily faith. But you can't do that apart from Jesus. Right. And so we need him. And so yeah. we were kind of busy, but all good things. You are indeed. Father Trujillo, Father Briganti are here with us to continue the season of Advent. Don't go away. Plenty more to come. Well, you are an important part of our EWTN family, and you know, we would love to hear from you. If you have a question for today's guests, Father John Tregilio and Father Ken Bergenti, you can give us a jingle right here during our live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205 271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we will use your question right here on the air. Well, we have Father John and Father Ken in the house. They are co-hosts of Web of Faith 2.0, taping new <laughs> episodes of their series Web of Faith 2.0. It airs Saturday evenings at 11 p.m. Eastern Time. You can check the EWTN.com for times in your area. Well, holy men of God, we're off and running, and welcome to Adam. Thank you so Jimmy much. Joy. We're happy to be here. We're excited to have you. But I want you to go one by one. I want you to tell, I want you to tell our family at home, because they always see you behind the computers, you know, and they're uh, you're being so techy and everything, <laughs> but they want to know the personal sides mm -hmm. of you. I know that you share some of you in the homily and stuff, and because I've listened to some of your beautiful sermons, but tell our family at home, you growing up years, your time that you got your call, how many years you're being a priest, and all the things that God has done. We'll go Father John, <laughs> and then we'll go Father Ken. Okay. Uh, well, I've been a priest for 28 and a half years now, and... Uh, I grew up uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, my mother was Polish, my dad was Sicilian, and I grew up with three brothers, and I had a baby sister who died then when she was very, uh, an infant. And since the time I was seven years old, when I made my first communion, is when I thought about becoming a priest. I had a, my mother's cousin was a priest, and uh, he would come and visit us every month regularly. And so his example, and I had a very devout pastor too, who was really, really in love with the Blessed Sacrament. In fact, that was the name of our parish, Blessed mm -hmm. Sacrament. So because of him and my cousin, the priest, that's when I really just, that's all I ever talked about. And uh, ironically, there was a nun in third grade, Sister Gertrude, God rest her now, and she, I always would talk in class, and she said, Mr. Tregilio, you're either going to be a radio announcer or a priest, because <laughs> you never shut up. Mm -hmm. And after I got ordained and I did some radio things for EWTN, I went to visit her at the old nun's home, and I said, Sister, remember me? Yeah, you're the guy that never shut up. I said, well, you're yeah. right, I'm a priest and I'm, I'm on radio I'm now. I'm doing That's both. Incredible. Wow, she was prophetic. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so I went to high school seminary. I'm one of those, what they call lifers. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a full sentence, so I had uh, four <laughs> years of high school. <laughs> yeah. Four years of high school seminary, uh, college seminary, and then I went to major theology, and uh, that's where I met uh, Father Briganti was in, mm -hmm. in major theology. And so uh, we've been friends since 1983, mm -hmm. since uh, those days. And um, I was ordained a priest for Harrisburg um, in 1988, 
um, Cardinal Keeler was the, the bishop at the time. And uh, what was nice was we had no deacons for the mass because we were deacons being ordained mm -hmm. priests and the deacon class would be after us. So we needed a deacon for the uh, ordination mass. So I said, well, Ken's coming. He's a deacon. He's going to be ordained a priest two weeks later. So I said, you wouldn't mind if we sort of rented him out, so to speak. And yeah. so he got better pictures than I did of my own ordination because <laughs> there he is with the bishop and all over the place. But it was a great uh, um, blessing to have him there yeah. uh, at, at my ordination. Beautiful. That's so beautiful. Father, can share with us a little bit about your own family growing up and your call to the ministry? Yes, uh, I grew up in New Britain, Connecticut, and um, Italian background, but I went to a Polish parish and school, uh, and we had wonderful sisters there, and um, I'm a delayed vocation. I got my calling in fourth grade. <laughs> okay. He got his in second. But, you know, these, uh, I, I teach now, I'm a uh, vice rector at the seminary right now, and all these wonderful seminarians have such great stories mm -hmm. about their vocations. Mine was so boring. Fourth grade, I felt like I got the call. And then Sister Mary Angeline, he had a great nun, I did too. She gave me a prayer book to the Holy Spirit. At that time it was called Prayer Book to the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. It was an old one. Mm -hmm. And she says, pray this every day. And then if God wants, you'll be called a priest and, and all. And, you know, it just developed. And I went to regular uh, Catholic high school. I didn't go to seminary. It was closed, the, uh, the seminary. And then um, went to college seminary. And then from there, uh, major seminary, and I was, uh, went to the Diocese of Metuchen, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So I'm also two, 28 and a half years ordained, uh, uh, ordained in the Marian year mm -hmm. of 1988. And I was very influenced by uh, a priest uh, in, that, who was a relative, uh, long gone. Uh, he was uh, Father Fiora. He was from, um, from Italy, and he worked for Congregation of Saints for the Salesian Order that he was mm -hmm. in. And uh, he came over from Italy in 1966. I was four years old. I'm sorry, five years old. And uh, we had a big family gathering and all that. And, and I would follow him and be like attached to his cassock, mm -hmm. you know. And he says, oh, someday, if, you know, if you pray hard enough, you'll be a priest. And we always wrote back and forth. I wrote in English, mm -hmm. he wrote in Italian, so I had to have my <laughs> parents <laughs> translate beautiful. it. And then uh, when I was ordained, um, I actually was, had a chance to go over after and visit him. And, uh, and, you know, and he died in 2004 mm -hmm. at the age of 94. And we went to our hometown. That it, it, the custom in, in Italy is even if you're with a religious community, you always are buried back with your family in your hometown. Mm -hmm. So I went there and I met the parish uh, priest of the town. He says, the custom of Italy, and that, especially that town or that area, he says, that the next surviving relative has to take the parish over, oh my which goodness. would have been me. <laughs> oh my so goodness. I said, boy, I would have been cool about that, but the uh, language would have been a little bit of a barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was very influential in my mm -hmm. life, and so was just the nuns, Sister Mary Angeline especially, and all the other sisters too. And I had a wonderful Catholic upbringing. Mm -hmm. My hometown had 13 Catholic churches, uh, eight Catholic schools, two Catholic high schools. It was, we, I didn't know anybody was not Catholic mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, so it was, it was wonderful to grow up in that environment. And, uh, and then now in the Diocese of Metuchen, New Jersey, it's a great, uh, great diocese. We're sandwiched in between Philadelphia and New York. Mm -hmm. So we're a big bedroom community. Yeah. Uh, but I was pastor there before I went to the seminary of a little tiny Italian parish. Uh, St. Anne's, and we had the wonderful religious sisters, Italian sisters, religious sisters, Filipini, and it was uh, it was sort of like a Bing Crosby going <laughs> going mm -hmm. my way moment mm -hmm. there. It was a, a little tiny parish. The people were wonderful. We had such great devotions there, and uh, the sisters ran a wonderful school. Mm -hmm. They still do, yeah. uh, St. Anne's School, and um, and then the bishop signed me to um, Mount St. Mary Seminary mm -hmm. and um, in Emmitsburg, Maryland which I was supposed to go there in the first place to study. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But at the last moment, they wanted to try another seminary. But God has a wonderful sense he of humor, does. so he sent me there anyway. <laughs> so, um, and I've been there now for eight years, and now I'm vice rector there, but I also assign the seminarians to their field, we call it field education, or their apostolates, mm -hmm. you know, in yeah. the, in the, in the um, different areas of their mm -hmm. growth in there. Mm -hmm. So it's been a wonderful uh, uh, 28 and a half oh, years, wow. and very... Uh, different things that we've been doing mm -hmm. as priests. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's truly And inspiring. television and books, all those wonderful things. <laughs> but I want to know, when you told your families, you know, you being so young, you know, that this was what you felt you were called to do, did they encourage you? Did they kind of 
Did anybody try and steer you <clears> in another <throat> direction? You know, how did, how did that work itself out? Well, I'd say my parents were very, very supportive. They never pushed me and never said, you know, you have to do this. But when I told them I wanted to go to the seminary, um, my brothers were happy because then I was going to leave the house because <laughs> had, we, we had a boarding you know, right. seminary. So uh, was one less mouth to feed. Yeah, get out of here. <laughs> Let him go. But no, my mom and dad were very supportive. They were mm -hmm. uh, devout practicing Catholics. My relatives, their siblings, my my aunts and uncles, are you sure you want to do this? You know, you want to go date for a while. Why do you want to go high school seminary? Why don't you go and blah blah blah? And I said, well, I I know what I want, mm -hmm. you know, and I would never could identify with with my colleagues who were completely clueless what to do with their life. I knew exactly, in fact, I wanted to be exactly like Father Levis, mm -hmm. and I was studying uh, at college seminary. I wanted to be a, a priest professor like he was and uh, teach at the Gannon University and, and that, and it, it didn't work out that way, but um, that was sort of my role model. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my, my family was very, very supportive. And I have to say, I never had any uh, regrets or second thoughts. There were a lot of bumps in the road, mm -hmm. detours, potholes, storms, and everything else. Mm -hmm. But uh, I persevered, and um, I have to also say Padre Pio, uh, his intercession, because mm -hmm. there were some really, really tough times. There was an old Monsignor at the high school seminary, Monsignor Gannon, who was promoting Padre Pio's cause, but no one ever heard about him. And he says, here, you pray to Padre Pio, wow. you'll get ordained. Mm -hmm. And it happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. wow. Father, share with us about your family, uh, and you've suffered some tragedy in your family with your siblings and loss mm -hmm. of life in your own family. Yeah, my, my parents uh, sadly had to a, a bury three of their of, of, the, of the five children. My sister was only three days old. Um, she was the first one, and uh, she died uh, just three days old. And then I had a brother, Michael, who had muscular dystrophy, and from the age of 10, he was in a wheelchair, and uh, yet never, never complained about his condition. And, uh, you know, when I would come home from the seminary, I would, you know, um, spend a lot of time with him. And he was a living saint, I tell you. He was inspirational. He, he would go to college mm. and study and all. And it was just a very, uh, uh, persevered in life yeah. and, and was always very up no matter what malady mm. he had. And it was very yeah, infectious. You, you, it was yeah. amazing mm -hmm. to see that strength because mm -hmm. his body was just deteriorating. Right. Um, and my father took good, good care of him because my mother was working. Uh, then, unfortunately, my dad came down with leukemia, and uh, but he was fighting the disease pretty pretty well until my my other brother, the second one, uh, was younger to me. He got killed by a drunk driver yeah. mm -hmm. uh, um, just a few blocks from the house. He was visiting my youngest brother, who was in the hospital for a form of leukemia, and on his way home, he got hit by this drunk driver, and. Um, that just, my father just, you know, he never recovered from that. And so he, six months to the day my brother was killed, he passed away. Mm. And uh, so that was a lot. And and, uh, and then being so far from home, I was about three, uh, 300 miles. I was in Harrisburg. They lived in Erie. And uh, it, was, it was difficult. I felt, always felt bad that I wasn't closer to mm -hmm. home mm -hmm. to help out uh, with all this stuff going on. And then just recently my mother passed away. Um, she, her health declined, and so I had moved her down from Erie to Harrisburg, and uh, of course, she didn't like leaving Erie, because yeah. like Father Ken's experience, it, it was predominantly Catholic town. We had 35 parishes mm -hmm. in the one, in the city, yeah. and four seminaries, and then a couple of high schools. So the only Protestant I knew was Billy Graham on TV, mm -hmm. and then I get, I'm a priest of Harrisburg, where we're only 12% Catholic, so yes. we're still considered a, a mission territory. But um, um, just seeing how, you know, God's grace is in, in the midst of all that trial and tribulation. I mean, um, my mother's faith was sustained because she used to help out with these car this, um, cloister Carmelites. And that really gave her mm -hmm. inspiration to keep going after all these um, tragic deaths and that. And, uh, you know, I can see that in the midst of these bad things, you get closer to, you see, you find out who your real friends are mm, right. because like Father Ken was very, very uh, helpful uh, in all these terrible tragedies. And that's, who, that's what, you, what you find your friends are there for. Mm -hmm. you, got, you got the fair, feather, fair weather friends who, yeah. you know, yeah. they just say hello. That's what I'm wondering as you're sharing, you know, um, that's a lot of hurt and sorrow and suffering and maybe questions. And, you know, how do you 
work through that as priests when you yourself are caring for so many people and yet you're getting hit and you're suffering loss? How do you manage to care for so many people and yet take care of yourself? How does well, well, I know from my, we both, uh, we have spiritual directors. Uh, and um, so uh, good priests that guide us and we can share what, whatever is on our hearts or on our minds. And they, and they really, uh, they objectively help us through that. And, and of course our prayer life is, uh, sustains us. You know, our, um, you know, we believe like Fulton J. Sheehan, a day, daily holy hour, mm -hmm. uh, and especially if we can in front of the Blessed Sacrament uh, is very important. Um, a devotion to Our Lady uh, also, um, uh, Our Lady of Sorrows uh, is, is uh, uh, she knows and she empathizes mm -hmm. and, um, and especially if we went through the total consecration, we give everything to her mm -hmm. and she sort of packages up and makes it a little bit easier for us mm -hmm. to carry. She doesn't, right. suffering never gets taken away, right. but it seems to be a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And also priestly fraternity. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. I, I had just buried my father a, a few months ago and I was just amazed. I said, how am I going to get through it? How am I going to mm -hmm. preach? Mm -hmm. at the, uh, the mass, how, deal with my mother mm -hmm. and all that. And it was all these priests who came to the wake, the bishop of my mm -hmm. diocese came mm -hmm. to the wake, all the sisters, uh, the nuns that had taught in the school and all uh, came. And then at the funeral mass, uh, uh, surrounded by uh, 12 priests, mm -hmm. um, they came to the cemetery. They took a whole, you know, all this time out. Mm -hmm. Three very good friends, uh, Father Miller, Father DeCastro, and Father Tregilio were mm -hmm. around me. And that made it uh, helped. And then after, you know, because after the burial and all that, right. you still have, then right. you get to grieve yourself. Sure. Uh, these priests were very good in, in coming to, uh, to support. Mm -hmm. So, and we, that reminds us when a, when a brother priest loses his family member, mm -hmm. we need to also go and support him as mm -hmm. well. It's a fraternity of men, yeah. uh, this priesthood. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful fraternity. And that's where you see it mm -hmm. come to action mm -hmm. is at a suffering like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. That is so beautiful and that, you know, like you said, making the consecration to Mary is, <clears throat> you know, because you have families, mm -hmm. you know, yet, yet you're giving your heart and your life away to a parish family, yeah. to a community, to a church. And, you know, like, you know, but my heart's bleeding too, you know, and, and the beauty of that yeah. community to support you yeah. and, and to was, come up uh, alongside yeah, you. I was very touched by the fact that when I, my mother was only about six months I had her in, in, near me, but I had parishioners who voluntarily would go and visit her mm -hmm. so that she, because she was not acclimated to that area, and they went on their own, go and say mm -hmm. hello and visit her, mm -hmm. and I thought well, that was so nice because I, I, you know, I didn't tell them to do it, and I, you know, I just someone had asked about is all right if we visit. Yeah. I said you know so that really helped um, knowing that that your your parish was like a family mm -hmm. to you because like you said you got nobody else. Uh, nearby and, mm -hmm. and that, and as Father Ken said, with, with the idea of priestly fraternity, one of the things we were telling to the seminarians is that that's the only way you keep your marbles mm -hmm. upstairs mm -hmm. and you keep your vocation right. is maintaining priestly fraternity because we belong to this confraternity of Catholic clergy where you support each other mm -hmm. and there's where some of the priests go off the deep end right. is they become like lone rangers, they're, they're, they're like Don Quixote fighting mm -hmm. the windmill and you say, well, you're not alone. You know, even if we only get together once a year, we have a nice uh, conference. Every five years we meet in Rome with guys from Australia mm -hmm. and, and England and Ireland. But just knowing that there's fellow priests who are on the same page as you are, mm -hmm. loyal to the church, uh, f uh, in love with the Blessed Mother, mm -hmm. want to celebrate reverent sacraments, you know that it's like the, the apostles. Jesus didn't just pick them one by one. Mm -hmm. You know, he had them as a group. You know, the apostles, the disciples, they even send them out two by two, not one by one. Mm -hmm. So fraternity is the essence right. of the priesthood. Mm -hmm. So important. Speaking with Father Ken <clears throat> Briganti and John Trujillo, you know them from Web of Faith 2.0. They're here. You can call in. You can ask some questions about their own lives, about the show. It's a beautiful Advent time preparing for the coming of the Lord. We're going to take a break at this point. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. We want to hear from you. Don't go away.
Welcome back. Well, remember that we want you to be a part of our show. If you have a question for Father John or Father Ken, give us a jingle right here during the live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. If you're going to call outside of North America, use area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we will use your question right here on the air. Father John, um when did you come to EWTN? How was those connections made? Did you get to meet Mother? What's well, it was all through Father Levis. Um, mm -hmm. It was 19, uh, let's see, 97 when we first got the, yep. the invitation. It was when it was Web of Faith. Web of Faith. And okay. we were answering questions already for EWTN. There was the faith okay. section that they still have now. Right. Father Baum and I um, were part of the team. Uh, we had started out with a one of those old-fashioned bulletin board systems where you had a uh, dial in, upload, download, you know, and you're psh, that type of thing. <laughs> and and, it would, and my brothers would be mad because when I would come home to visit, I would hog up the telephone line yeah. for my modem, you know, my yeah. 300 baud modem. Oh it would take up all goodness. that. Those bandwidth. are people who really wanted to ask a question. That's, get were, an these answer. These are the serious <laughs> people. Yeah, these are serious people. And then the World Wide Web came out, and so we started answering questions. And then EWTN w ventured out into the uh, internet. So we were doing that for a couple of years, and then one day. But Bob says, I got a phone call from uh, somebody at EW10, I think it was Doug Keck, said, we would like to do a, a program with you guys answering questions. I said, oh, that sounds interesting. He goes, yeah, but at, at your computers. Well, I couldn't imagine, because I thought, I'm at, when I'm answering questions, I'm by myself, mm -hmm. and I'm typing on a computer, that looks boring as mm -hmm. it can possibly get. And they said, oh, no, 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 it would be you and Father Bob in the same room. I said, us in the same room typing. No, 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 you're going to discuss out loud your answers to these yeah. questions. And we thought it was going to be like, well, okay, we'll do one episode and that'll be it. Yeah. Well, it lasted like, I think we were in five, several years. I did with Father Levis, then yeah. uh, he had to retire uh, for health reasons. And it was so doing so well that they didn't want to retire the show. Right. So then Father Brigenti came on board. That's why it's Web of Faith 2.0 now, because Father Bob and I were 1.0, mm -hmm. even though we didn't <laughs> call it that back then. <laughs> Wow, powerful. I, I used to love watching you both, love to watch you both now. And I'm thinking about that setting. You know, I, I could see these like kind of green lamps. Oh, that, those, that was the, the old set. Yes. The old set. And then the, 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 what they call the promos or what people in, and sometimes call commercials. Uh, after, those are more difficult than, than answering the questions because you had to learn some lines in that. And they had this one promo where the Father Bob's monitor would explode. <laughs> and he said, I can't, there's so many questions coming in, John, I can't keep up. And then <laughs> it would explode. Well, the first time it exploded at the wrong point. So Father Bob fell off the chair. <laughs> so then we had to do it again. And he started laughing before, and he said, Father Bob, you're laughing. Because the thing is going to explode. You're not supposed to know that, but I do know it. <laughs> and the guy oh, goes, boy. we got one charge left. Mm -hmm. Make it work. Oh, so we did. Bless well, his heart. With love watching you both. And of course, uh, Father Bob had a few years on you. And you can, you, you, <laughs> can and, say that. And you can see the, the respect and the love. That I wouldn't was be there. a priest today if it wasn't for him. Really? He, I mean, not only was he my teacher and instructor, spiritual director, confessor, but he's the one who got me into the Diocese of Harrisburg. Yeah. Uh, he's the one that um, gave me solid advice, encouraged me, chastised me, um, and we were friends and uh, yeah. all the way up until his passing. In fact, he gave me the great honor of asking me to preach at his funeral. Mm. I preached at his um, 60th anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, he preached at my mass. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I just, he was the, the, the kindest priest. And I said, if I could be half the priest he was, uh, I'd be That's happy. Beautiful. So beautiful. Father, you came on board how many years ago? Uh, seven show? years ago. They, after uh, Father Levis uh, became ill and he, sight was becoming a problem, he, he retired, he wanted to retire from the show. And, um, so I think EWTN then let it um, lapse for a while just out of respect for uh, Father Levis. And then when they decided to bring it back, they, um, because uh, Father Dragilio and I, we co-authored some books together, they thought that would be a natural um, good partnership to do that. And mm -hmm. So that's how that all came about. And, and we had, had done a TV series before <laughs> together. We did, yeah. based on the books, we did the Crash Course series, like Crash Course in Catholicism, right. Crash Course in the John. Saints, and yeah. Crash Course in John Paul II. Okay. So we had done this series before, and so uh, that was like a natural progression. Mm. 
Father, what, what do you find in terms of people's interests or what they're calling in about or emailing you about, what their concerns are? Right. Because we get the question, all year they save up the questions. It's whatever's going on that year okay. is, seems to be the heavy uh, point of the, um, of the question. So, uh, um, uh, you're immersing must have been a lot. Do, or do they people ask about that? Um, well, we're just we're, yeah, you, there, were, there were quite a few questions yeah. on grace, yeah. on con the sacrament of penance, on confession. So that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the series we're doing right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then years past, uh, there was a, uh, lots of questions on marriage. Uh, one year, and one year it was on a lot on the Eucharist, on transubstantiation. I mean, there would be all other questions too, yeah. but it seemed like there would be like a concentration mm -hmm. of pe on people's minds. So it, it, it all depends on what was going on and what celebration the church was going through. or yeah, Like or when the new you. missile came out, there was a lot that of questions. That was when we had a lot of Eucharist right. questions yeah. mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. Or papal visits, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. Well, we're going to go straight to an email, okay? <laughs> it's as many times the things Pope Francis says are twisted by the press and others. There is a lot of confusion right now, especially surrounding Amorius Latite. How are faithful Catholics supposed to know what to believe? And this is Jenny from San Diego. Ooh. <laughs> well, I, I can feel for Jenny because it can be confusing. There, you're hearing all these voices, and we have to remember that there is an official uh, process by which the church um, disseminates, dis, decimate, or <laughs> disseminates, disseminates uh, <laughs> the the, um, the teachings, and that's through the, um, the Congregation of Doctor of the Faith. Cardinal Ratzinger had been the prefect for that uh, before he became Pope Benedict, and things that the Pope says off the cuff remarks, little interviews, and that, uh, while that is from the Pope, uh, they don't have the same official weight as when, he, if he wants to, and he certainly knows this because he is the Pope, that he can issue this as a more official. Uh, st uh, status. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of these things are either his opinion or he talks in, in a very colloquial fashion, uh, more like a pastor, like, you, you know, like after mass people come to you and say things and you just talk to them. Um, Pope Benedict was, was the, you know, quintessential uh, professor, you know, so ever, he always thought things over and over and over again before he ever said anything. So he would give you a very like, almost like dissertation uh, whenever he issued a, a statement. Pope Francis is more of that pastoral approach where he says something and then maybe he needs to tweak it a little bit. Not that what he said initially was wrong, but maybe it, it, it's, it has a few ambiguities to it. Okay. But also, you have to realize that sometimes the secular media, when, they're, when they quote our doctrines or that, they're, they're zeroing on one little thing. They take it out of context because they have their own political right. persuasions mm -hmm. that they want to do. Uh, so you have to be careful where you get your media. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the National Catholic Register is right. a great place mm -hmm. to go. It's 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 very objective, uh, and uh, it it presents the the uh, the, the true uh, um, um, teaching of the church in a in a very great way. So that's that that would yeah. be one thing. Mm -hmm. EWTN, of right. course, mm -hmm. uh, the world over, and mm -hmm. the news programs at night, and shows like this that mm -hmm. are being discussed. Uh, another great resource. Uh, obs uh, the official Vatican paper is Observatory Romano, which you can get into English as mm -hmm. well. Um, so these are things that help you. Also, reading the document. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody, you know, <clears throat> everybody said, makes a comment. But they never that read it. You know? read and right. if you just take time and read, like we just now, the, the, um, the new uh, document came out on seminaries mm -hmm. and seminarians. So that's our Christmas project that Father John and I are mm -hmm. going to be reading mm -hmm. over there because it has to do with formation. Yeah. Uh, and already the secular media taking little things yeah. out and sound bites and things like that to try to distort the message. And Pope Francis was very upset. He said, be careful about fake news, right. you know. Mm -hmm. And so he realizes himself that sometimes secular media uh, will uh, steal things and not present it in the best possible light. Mm -hmm. Plus they want to reduce everything to a sound bite. Like a sound bite oh, or, yeah. or, 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 or if it fit in a, tw a tweet. Right. You know, right. and it's true that sometimes, you know, like I said, the Holy Father will give you a short little statement, mm -hmm. but that's not intended to be the full formal teaching mm -hmm. uh, expression. And when that takes place, like when he writes his letters, you have to read the whole thing in context. Right. I remember when he wrote his one thing on the, uh, um, on the, uh, the um, economics, people were saying, oh, he's against capitalism. Right. The word capitalism does not appear in that document once. Mm -hmm. What does appear is a word that Pope John Paul and Pope Benedict mentioned, consumerism. Mm -hmm. There's a distinction between consumerism and capitalism. 
The Pope didn't trash capitalism. Mm -hmm. He did say what the other Pope said, that unbridled consumerism right. is, right. is just as bad as the state control in communism. Mm -hmm. right. You mentioned a new document on seminarians or mm -hmm. seminaries and so on. Uh, what's the title of that, do you call it? The Latin title, okay. Fundamentalis, um, I don't know, remember the second one. Ratio Fundamentalis. Oh, that's it, Ratio okay. Fundamentalis, yes. See, it takes two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's our weird to get. It just came out like a couple yeah. of days, uh, over the weekend oh, really? we got okay. it. Yeah. It's a, it's a, a, in English, it just mm -hmm. was okay. The first one came out in 1981, was it? Right. Yeah. What, what do you, I mean, you're both involved in the seminary, St. Mary's there in Emmitsburg, right? And what, what's your kind of take on what's going on just in terms of vocations, in terms of, you know, we speak about guys that went into seminary under John Paul II, the John Paul II kind of generation in men. What kind of people are coming in or inquiring, are numbers increasing, what, what's going on? Well, I, I still see that uh, the seminarians that are coming in are basically, we still consider them John Paul II seminarians mm -hmm. because their pastors have been formed even the, you know, most of them are younger pastors mm -hmm. now. And, uh, and of course our seminary guidelines, the Pastora Daba Vobis, you know, the four pillars that John Paul II outlined, is to how we run the seminary. So he's definitely very influential in reforming the seminaries, mm -hmm. John Paul the Great. And, uh, and what I see now is the products of that because these now priests are mm -hmm. in the parishes mm -hmm. encouraging vocations and they're coming in and we just we, we marvel at it. and some of the other priest faculty says wow they're so, <laughs> not like when we were seminaries there, I mean there were, it was wonderful to see how on fire in the mm -hmm. faith wow. and not that we personally weren't like that mm -hmm. but the general milieu right. at the time in the mm -hmm. 80s was not mm -hmm. like what they are on today, mm -hmm. uh, like on fire with the faith and genuine holiness. And mm -hmm. so many already come in uh, with a Marian devotion mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Now, their family, personal family lives may not be like ours right. intact. Mm -hmm. You know, a uh, lot, lot of them come from broken homes, mm -hmm. so just like anything else. Right. But their faith is so strong. And this is what I've noticed, and it has to be because their priests have also been formed under John Paul the Great in the seminaries, and now you're seeing the products of it as they're coming into the seminary life. So. And you're seeing priests from all over the country. Yes, we're right? national. Mm, and you. we also are international, too. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a few uh, that are from um, outside the country. Uh, we did uh, from um, Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. and uh, they were just ordained. and um, and. We uh, so we have here mm -hmm. here and there some yeah. um, foreign beautiful, but mostly we're national. Good. Well, we have Inez on the phone. Inez, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question for Father Ken or Father John? Well, for either one of them, uh, I first let me tell you, I love your show. I love both of you. You're so real and so down to earth, <laughs> and it, I enjoy watching you. But um, I wanted to know, uh, Mary was qu crowned queen of the universe or queen of heaven, and they said she wore a crown of 12 stars. What do the 12 stars represent? Thanks for your question. Thank you, Inez. Thank you. Oh, Book of Revelation. By you. Yeah, we, we just read in, our, in the gospel yeah. today, mm -hmm. uh, there appeared in the sky, sky a great sign, a woman clothed with the sun and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Biblical scholars tell us that the, that the 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. So that she is the queen, because her son, Jesus, um, is the, the word made flesh, and the church is the mystical body of Christ, so she's the mother of the mystical body. She's the mother of the church. She's the queen of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. And so because of her relationship to Jesus, the king, her queenship derives from his kingship. Just like in England, when the queen mother was alive, she was only queen because first her husband was the king and then her daughter was the queen. Mary's queenship derives from Jesus' kingship. Mm -hmm. But the 12 stars, remember there's this wonderful parallel with the 12 tribes and then Jesus picking 12 apostles mm -hmm. to sort of um, fulfill that, that, that uh, prophecy. And, and you shared about some of that on your, in your sermon this morning. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and if you look back at the Old Testament, like Solomon, uh, the, it is the queen mother that had mm -hmm. the influence, mm -hmm. uh, not uh, Solomon's wives. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in that line, as Mary is the queen mother, uh, that's where we get our, the, her role of intercessory power for us, uh, just as Solomon listened to his mother, our blessed Savior also takes the prayers of his mother on our behalf to him. So that great intercessory power of the queen mother, mm -hmm. uh, I think is so from the Old Testament, mm -hmm. uh, very biblical. 
and um, uh, and her feast is August 22nd, which mm -hmm. comes right after her, the Assumption. So uh, uh, if you're praying the glorious mysteries, it's uh, the, uh, the fourth mystery is, of course, the Assumption, and the fifth is the Coronation of mm -hmm. Mary. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's very fitting that it's like the culmination. Mm -hmm. And all her attributes, all her titles, is because she is the Mother of God, mm -hmm. not because anything of herself, but that she is to bring the Savior into the world. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. Well, you nailed Inez's question. Way to go, guys. Do you find your, your questions, when people are asking you questions or emailing, do you know if they're Catholic or Protestant or they just kind of submit them? Do you think you're getting questions from people that are non-Catholics? Oh, yeah. Especially yeah. in this area. They'll, but they going, usually tell you. They mm -hmm. didn't. Yeah. yeah. On there. Sometimes the convert. way they phrase yeah. it, too, yeah. um, you know, they can, if the way they describe the Eucharist or... What lens they're coming from. Yeah, that, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And we do get a lot of questions from both sides of the fence, so to mm -hmm. speak, Catholic and non-Catholic. We just met a, um, which was interesting, uh, one of our, our, our uh, seminaries that we were uh, in Baltimore area, St. Mary Seminary, mm -hmm. we went to their celebration of their anniversary, and we met a deacon who's going to be a priest um, who's studying at another seminary in Washington, and he said he picked up our Catholicism for Dummies book mm -hmm. and he had a reversion into the church. Mm -hmm. And through that, uh, he, he's now going to be a priest. See, how beautiful. I mean, it, it was like, and his yeah. Father John says, oh, I, I know he, Father Ken's not going to believe this. You've got to come over and talk to me about it. I tell people right <laughs> in and say, right. your, your book is <clears throat> helpful to me. He goes, no, no, you're making it up. You're yeah. making it up. No. I said, look, it is and so I dragged and the guy over. Him and I said, wow, how, if it was just for the one person, yes. right. it was successful. Right. Yeah. And so you you both authored Catholicism for Dummies, right? Yes. I would have did that. That could have been my RCIA <laughs> class because I'm a many, convert. Many of them use it because it has an imprimatur. No, right. So you could and use it as a catechism. That would have been. That would have. I think it would have been very enriching, right? We well, we're going to go straight to another email. It says it seems so many Catholics today know so very little about their own faith, and I've talked to some who don't even know how to recite the Rosary. Needless to say, they cannot pass the faith on to their own children. Why do you feel so many Catholics take so little interest in learning what their faith's about? And this is Scott from Alpena, Michigan. Well, I would say, first of all, there was a <clears throat> whole generation that we lost. Um, right after the council, um, catechisms went berserk. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm a pro I'm, I grew up in that era. Right. I was lucky. I had very good sisters. Mm -hmm. We still used the Baltimore mm -hmm. Catechism, but many didn't, and they were doing, you know, uh, posters. Butterflies. And butterflies. Oh, yeah. Pet and rocks. They were not getting, and it, <laughs> yes. and it wasn't until St. John Paul the Great standardized mm -hmm. the catechism, which then became the basis for all the catechisms to be taught in the school mm -hmm. and the children, that this is now being um, um, uh, given to, to our ch ch children. But we still have that whole mm -hmm. era uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a generation lost mm -hmm. because of that. And some of them are coming back little by little. Uh, reversions are happening. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second part would be the breakup of the family unit. Mm -hmm. um, so with the breakup, you know, this child's with the parent on this weekend who may not be going to Mass, mm -hmm. this child's the other parent that does go to mass sends mixed signals mm -hmm. and confusion, uh, so you don't have that that uh, the core of the unity in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, but then on the third case, you do have very strong families, and in those is where the faith is being nurtured and given, and uh, so there is always uh, definitely hope in the future. And now with the catechism is much mm -hmm. better, uh, parishes are becoming uh, more alive with parish missions mm -hmm. and. And um, there's a, a, a really, a re what they call the, new, uh, Jane Paul, John Paul the Great said, the new evangelization called for it. You can see this. And the new evangelization, you don't have to go to foreign countries. It's right, right in your own That's parish, right. community, family. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that. Mm -hmm. uh, but he is the, the impetus of the mm -hmm. new evangelization by the things that he left us, the new mm -hmm. code of canon law, mm -hmm. the catechism, uh, the reform of the seminary, mm -hmm. uh, the the theology of the body. Yes. I mean, you just go on mm -hmm. and on and mm -hmm. on. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's his vision of the council that we're experiencing mm -hmm. now and all its wonderful benefits. But it's going to take a while. Right. Beautiful well, fruit. We're going to take that. a break at this point. We're going to go on and on and on. We're going to keep you <laughs> over for the next segment. We'll be right back. Please don't go away.
Welcome back. Well, you're an important part of our EWTN family, and you know you could have joined us here today live on At Home. You could have been a member in our studio audience. You could have met these two holy men of God. Could have had a V8. You could have. <laughs> well, what were you thinking? You were thinking you need to contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department. Just do that by emailing them, pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Give them a jingle at 205 271 2966 and come to Birmingham, Alabama. We would certainly love to have you. Well, right now we're going to go straight to Rome to hear from Joan. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, greetings from Rome on this third week of Advent. And of course, as you know, today is the feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And in very short order in the Basilica right behind me, uh, Pope Francis will celebrate Mass. And there's quite a good sized group of Mexicans here for this holiday. In fact, some of them were in the square just days ago in very colorful costumes. Now, the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City is the most visited Catholic shrine in the entire world. And it's been Pope Francis's desire for a long time to pray before the image of this miraculous mantle. He was able to do so earlier this year when he was in Mexico City for a visit. He was able to pray, actually looking at the image, which normally faces the congregation, but it can be turned around and there's a very small room where someone may pray as the Pope did on that day. Now turning to yesterday in St. Peter's Square, of course, the Angelus, the Holy Father had words for the victims of quite a number of terror attacks around the world that had occurred just kind of before he was reciting the Angelus. And he said, there's only one response to such violence, faith in God, and unity in human and civil values. Now, of course, we know in Egypt, a bomb exploded outside of St. Mark's Coptic Cathedral, and about 25 or so people were killed in that. More than a dozen were killed in Somalia when a suicide bomber struck people in Mogadishu. And then we also know that um, in Turkey, several dozen people died in two bomb attacks outside of a stadium. Now, one cute thing about yesterday, the third Sunday of Advent, this is also known here in Rome anyway, as Bambinelli Sunday. The Bambinello are the little figures of the baby Jesus and children's, hundreds of children came to St. Peter's Square yesterday. They held up their little statues of baby Jesus for the Pope to bless them. And this he did with great joy. And then he asked them to sing. It was a great day. Time's up, back to you. Thank you so much, Joan. Another wonderful report there from Rome. And um, we talk about being family here at EWTN and Joan really helps us to understand the family right there in Rome. And we're going to Rome in March with the seminarians. Oh, yes. beautiful. A little pilgrimage. A lot of them, this is their first time. From St. Mary's? Mount, Mount St. Mary's. Mount St. Mm -hmm. Mary's. Mm -hmm. And there's two St. Mary's in right. Maryland. That's right. One's St. Mary's and one's Mount St. Mary's. Yes. Okay. And we're at the Mount. You're okay. at the Mount. And so yeah. you're going to go see Joan again. We're going to see Joan and Good. we're going to, um, Father Burgenti uh, has a nice trip uh, planned for them. And, uh, we, we have 26 we... seminarians coming. Oh, on the beautiful. Unfortunately, the Holy Father is going to be on retreat that week. We were mm. hoping to have a papal audience. Mm -hmm. But we're going to go to the Scavi underneath the ex uh, excavation under St. Peter's. We're going to go to Constel Gandolfo because it's open now to mm. the public. Yes, and he doesn't live there. <laughs> That's yeah. right. That's right. So. Somebody else can go there. Right. And I remember, I've been, many times I've been to Italy. I've never been to Castel Gandolfo. Mm, it's a town, be, yeah. but not inside. So mm -hmm. it's kind of uh, exciting. Oh, that'll be beautiful. Yeah. Well, share with us just your own observations. Just, we only have two minutes left. Two minutes <laughs> left. Yeah. Observations just, just, you know, the church at the crossroads of society and, and what's going on in the country, in the world, how, how you see things today. Well, I think the church is... Um, more relevant than ever before because so many of the other things have just disappeared and fallen apart and even though we endured a horrible time of scandal we in, we survived you know mm -hmm. we survived schisms uh, schisms before this and all kinds of of bad things happening we, we we survived by god's grace so i tell people that you know the the church herself is indefectible but her members are individual sinners mm -hmm. and you know that's the way god set it up so we shouldn't lose hope and when you see the great saints that have come forth in all these different eras, yeah. uh, that's a sign of the working of the Holy Spirit. And it, it's something that I think even non-Catholics are just drawn to. They're, they're amazed by the fact that if this was of human origin, it would have disintegrated mm -hmm. a long time ago. Mm -hmm. 
Father, your observation, and maybe kind of add into that the role of EWTN in terms of being leaven and seasoning for this world. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I know when I was pastor myself, the parishioners were becoming educated through the programs on EWTN and uh, had wonderful, they would bring these comments or mm -hmm. wonderful questions to me. And uh, so it's a great, uh, as Pope John Paul, the great call for the new evangelization, uh, the media mm -hmm. is a great source of that part of that evangelization, whether it's the radio or it's uh, printed through the, the, the National Catholic mm -hmm. Register or through uh, the studio here. Yeah. Uh, it is a vital source of that new evangelization. Mm -hmm. Fathers, can you give us a blessing? Can you do that together or individually? Oh, sure, oh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay. The blessing of Almighty God, God, the Father, Father the, the Son, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Spirit descend and upon you and reign with you forever. You forever. Amen. 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 It's Thank been an absolute you. Oh, it's been a joy. Yes. <laughs> ah, no pun intended. <laughs> Remember, you're an important part of this EWTN family, and you're always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now.